In Jesus, you are fully known and fully forgiven and fully loved. This is why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. All right, this is a little bit bigger crowd than the the first graders. Um, But I am Jeremy Haskell. I'm the kids pastor here. And thank you so much for welcoming me into the new, into the new role of, of kids pastors. And I thank you for the many different ways you guys are all involved in uh, ministering to the kids at TCF. I thank you for your generosity. Um, for example, those, that fundraiser with the envelopes helped keep the cost down for summer camp. And uh, most of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for your prayers. We love to tell the kids, um, the Bible's true and God loves you. And this is how my brain works. Um, one of the re- reasons why the Bible's true is that there's, there's, well, like, if you read stories and watch movies, it seems like there's never characters with the same name. But not so in the Bible. There's, there's two Sauls, for example. And uh, when, when there's King Saul and there's Saul, who's Paul. So when Travis asked me to teach... Um, I said, well, can I, can I teach what we're going over, doing over there in the Sunday school? And he says, sure. And so we are in the book of Acts and that uh, well-known story of the conversion of Saul. And that's Acts chapter 9. But you can turn there, but I'm going to have you turn to two different places first. But um, it's so well-known that if I say, who comes to mind as a modern-day Saul or modern-day Paul, um, who, who do you think of? And for me, it's uh, Rosaria Butterfield. I got this quote from the back of a Ligonier Ministries magazine, Table Talk. She says, I considered myself an atheist. I found Christians to be dif- difficult, sour, fearful, and intellectually unengaged people. In addition, since the age of 28, I had lived in monogamous lesbian relationships and politically supported LGBT causes. I was at Syracuse University as a professor of English and women's studies. I was terrified of a world view that called me, my life, my community, my scholarly interests, and my relationships sin. Add to this that I was working on a book exposing the religious right from a lesbian feminist point of view. I approached the Bible with an agenda to tear it down because I firmly believed it was threatening dangerous, and irrational. But when I came to Christ, I experienced what the 19th century Scottish theologian Thomas Chalmers called the expulsive power of a new affection. At the time of my conversion, my lesbian identity and feelings did not vanish. As my union with Christ grew, the sanctification that it birthed put a wedge between my old self and my new one. In time, this contradiction exploded, and I was able to claim Identity in Christ alone. Yeah, Dr. Rosaria Butterfield is an author of several books, including The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, and her latest Five Lives of Our Anti-Christian Age. She's also a speaker, a pastor's wife, and a homeschool mom. Now, how would you know that this is a modern-day Paul? Because the story of Saul's conversion is so well known. And Saul's conversion is super important. It's described in Acts three times. Acts chapter 9, what we'll be looking at. Acts chapter 22, when Paul's before a mob. And Acts chapter 26, before King Agrippa. So it's very important to Luke. And there's actually a fourth description of his conversion in Galatians chapter 1. And by the way, Saul is his Hebrew name. And Paul... uh, Later on in the book of Acts, Luke uses his Roman or Greek name, Paul. So he had two names, Saul and Paul. So it's super important, this conversion. This is taken from New Testament scholar, Professor John Gresham Machen. He said, the conversion of Saul is one of the most important events in human history. The Christian movement in A.D. 35 would have appeared a superficial, to a superficial observer to be a Jewish sect. Thirty years later, it was plainly a world religion. This establishment 
as a world religion to almost as great as an extent as any great historical movement can be ascribed to one man was the work of Paul, end quote. And you, we all know it's because of Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. Now just think of Paul. His ministry, his, his being, him as a missionary, his church planning, God gave him a love for people. And just think of his works, his writings. Just one of his letters alone of the 13 in the New Testament, Romans, the book of Romans. Man, how God has used his writings, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to our lives for days, years, decades. And it's just unbelievable. So, uh, you're going to turn to two passages before Acts chapter 9, but the breakdown is, the, or the outline is, in 9 verses 1 through 31, it's the four settings of the story. On the road to Damascus, verses 1 through 9, three days in Damascus, verses 10 through 19, Damascus, then Jerusalem, verses 19 through 30, and lastly, the epilogue in verse 31. Now, um, before we get to the road to Damascus, what's Saul's backstory? And backstories are totally in these days if you watch movies and stuff. But what's his backstory? It's Paul is first mentioned, and here's where I want you to turn, Acts chapter 7, 58. So Paul, Saul is first mentioned in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. And remember, um, Stephen's sermon, and after Stephen's sermon, they took him out to kill him. Um, so Acts chapter 7, verse 58. If you're the kids, I said, if you get there, raise your hand. All right. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. So they cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And that word ravage, the church. The word picture is of a wild boar, a wild animal just thrashing around the gardens, just tearing it up. And that's what Saul was. Can you imagine the trauma? Someone breaking into your house and dragging you off to prison? And so that's... Saul. And who was this guy? A second, in the second description of his conversion in Acts 22 verse 3, he starts by saying, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamil, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. And in Galatians 1, 13 through 14, he says, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. And one of my favorites that describes who Paul is, and Pastor Garrett read this a couple weeks ago, and I love it so much. Uh, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. This is who, it's all, all part of Paul's backstory and now who he was. Philippians chapter 3 says, oh wait, wait. Is it? Yes, chapter 3. He was circum, I was circum, this is Paul. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as of the law. 
a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, what's he say? Blameless. And here's a spoiler alert. Verse 7, but whatever I gained, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And go ahead and turn back to chapter 9 of Acts. Why is this backstory important? Because we think of Saul's conversion all of the sudden. And it was kind of all of a sudden. It was unexpected. He wasn't looking for Jesus. But remember, all of this, all of this, God had been working on Saul for a long time. He was prepping him. Saul had learned the Hebrew scriptures, right? He knew them inside and out. But did he really know them? He probably, he probably heard Stephen's sermon, but it was because he was stubborn, and we'll see, he'd been kicking against the goads. It's got to hurt. Uh, pastor, UK pastor uh, Colin Smith says, goads were sharpened sticks used by shepherds to prod stubborn animals. When you do evangelism, so remember, when you do evangelism, when you share uh, the gospel with somebody, if you want somebody to know Christ so bad, we've all been there. We all have those people in our lives. Listen to their story and have the faith to remember God has been working on that person longer than you have. And it's not you they're rejecting. They're rejecting God and their stubbornness of heart. So think of Paul's, Saul's backstory, And of course, of course, God chooses the right person at the right time. So on the road to Damascus, and why Damascus? Because it was a very important city. Um, I, and I think it's Luke's way of showing us that there's Christians. This is how there's Christians there. This is how the gospel spread to even Damascus. Um, it's 130 miles away from Jerusalem, north, northeast of Jerusalem. And so you see Saul's passion right away. Man, he has to stop the spread of this uh, new religion. He's got to stop it from spreading. So Acts chapter 9, verse, verses 1 through 2 says... But everybody there, chapter 9, verse 1 through 2. And when I do this with the kids, like, it's worth it for them to navigate the Bible. But it might take 10 to 15 minutes just trying to find this. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that, so that if he found any belonging to the way, and that's uh, what the early Christians were called. If any, if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now you heard of ball is life? That's basketball. Like you eat, breathe, and sleep basketball. Well, Saul's life, that's what his life was. Just all consumer breeding threats and murders to Christians. He was all about persecuting them and killing Christians. That's his passion. And um, that he needed letters to make this okay. He was a rule follower. Um, do, you, do, you have a, do you know any rule followers? Do you have any of those in your family? But anyways, he asked for letters, permission to take prisoners belonging to the way. And it's like when Jesus said in John 16 two, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. You know, all of that is Saul before Christ. Now think about this. Have you ever thought about God's backstory? What's God's backstory? God of the Bible's backstory. Well, as you know, he's first mentioned where? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is the uncreated and everything else is created. He is the creator of the universe. And what do kids always ask? They always ask this, well, where did God come from? Who created God? He always was, always is, and always will be. Just like that song, that closing song we sung. He's the triune God. I have the kids repeat after me. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is the great I am. At my daughter's school, they learned this uh, catechism question. What is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, 
unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And one of my favorite verses from Isaiah, Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. There is no other, um, besides me, there is no other God. I mean, so have that in your mind. God's backstory when we read this amazing conversion of Saul. Um, have that backstory because this is how God does things. And what did God do? Verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly, a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And that's when I'd have the kids go, uh-oh. But rise, verse 6, rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So this is super important because this is where Paul saw Jesus. This qualifies him as an apostle. So he saw Jesus in the form of a bright light. And, and this is what Barnabas would say. It's not, we're not there yet. But when he brings Saul to the apostles, he says he had seen Jesus the Lord. And this is mentioned all over Paul's letters. In 1 Corinthians 15, 8, he says, Last of all, as to, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So this qualifies him as an apostle. What Paul wrote, those 13 letters, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's God's word. So you can't just say, well, I just believe in Jesus. I just believe the gospel is what Jesus said. No, it's all of it. Paul speaking is God's word. He qualifies, of, qualifies him as an apostle. He saw Jesus Christ. Now, what did God do? God showed up in a divine revelation. It's like the, the, the transfiguration. It's supernatural. R.C. Sproul says, if you take away the supernatural from the New Testament, you have gutted the New Testament. And I would add, you've gutted the whole Bible. And God, and, and I just picture this double calling of Saul. Saul, Saul. It's like Jesus is just crying out, Saul, I want to rescue you. And what's he do? The second thing God does, he convicts him. Paul's response is a question. Who are you, Lord? Well, he gets that this is a heavenly vision. And the answer is, I am Jesus who you are persecuting, okay? To persecute the way or the church is to persecute Jesus. And Paul, Saul knew he should be punished, okay? And just a sidebar, just a sidebar, be careful how you talk about other Christians. Um, and be careful how you talk about the church. The people in the church, um, Paul would writ later write 1 Corinthians 12. It's the body of Christ. We're all important, all members. You believe in Jesus Christ, we're all members. And, uh, and we're all important. We all matter. We're doing our thing. So be careful. I mean, we're probably not persecuting other Christians, but just, just Lord, help us to guard our lips and pray for unity. Pray those big prayers for unity. I mean, I always say it's like 31 flavors of the Holy Spirit, right? All over the place, and, and the local church, and then universal church, and uh, so he convicts him. And when you start that journey of faith, what a great question! Who? This is a question, first question forever. Who are you, Lord? Who is Jesus Christ? Now, the second question is awesome. Even though Paul doesn't, Saul doesn't ask this, ask a question. Um, Jesus says, "You will be told." Verse six: You will be told what to do. Are you going to trust me? Saul's not told what he's going to do. It's just go. Just go. Can you trust me? I don't know what I'm just going. What are you going to tell me to do? And those two questions right off the bat for your journey of faith. Who is Jesus? And man, as you fall in love with him, you want to learn more. So you read the Bible more. And the more you read your Bible, the more you fall in love with him. It's awesome. 
this journey of faith, and are you willing to trust him? And the third thing, uh, and right off the bat, he has to trust God because he's, how, how is he supposed to go to Damascus? He's blind. So right off the bat, he has to trust God by trusting the men who are with him. And it's very humbling. And that's the third thing God does. He humbles Saul. Saul is powerless, helpless, dependent, and weak. And fully relying on God. It takes humility, you guys, to trust in somebody else. Have you ever been there? In my old office, I had above my head, delegate or die. Because <laughs> I, ha- I have to rely on the Lord to rely on other people to help me. And uh, it's interesting, his, his eyes were blind. I, I'm sorry, his eyes were open and he was blind. And he had to be led by the hand of someone else. That's God's plan, God's way. In the self-promotion age of promoting self, man, isn't humility beautiful? Refreshing. And that's what God does. He's, he humbled Saul. So I got to hustle here. Um, for three days, so uh, for three days, Saul was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So Saul had time to think about what God had done in his life. That divine revelation showing up, humbling him, speaking to him. And this is, look at verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 10 through 12. And now, three days in Damascus, what else is happening? Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vis- in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now the Lord's doing this all the time, doing something over here, doing something over there. I mean, s- some grandma's praying for their kid, and that's... And, and this person's showing up, telling them, bringing them to church. It happens all the time. Just recently, um, I was driving by my neighbors, and it looked like he needed help. He was trying to load something into his bed of his truck. And I just prayed, Lord, should I help my neighbor? And Quince said, go help me. You know, like, yeah, I felt like, go help him. And as soon as I got there, my neighbor was like, I was just praying for someone to come and help me load my truck. And so God's doing this. So here's Saul praying, and here's uh, Ananias, the Lord showing up in a vision. Ananias, and Ananias says, here I am, Lord, and doesn't that sound familiar? And, uh, and, and the Lord told Ananias to receive Saul. And it's a specific. What do I do? Rise and go. Where do I go? Go to a, a street. Go to Straight Street at Judas' house. And where, why, who do I go to? And then he puts on the brakes, right? You go to Saul. Because it's like, here's this hesitation. Look at verses uh, 15. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 13 through 14. But Ananias answered him, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So can you, he's heard all these reports about the evil. It's gotten, it's spreading all the way to Damascus. And can you blame him? He, he might have heard about the stoning of Stephen. He might have thought, man, this persecution is why I left Jerusalem in the first place. Um, I try to get away from this guy, Saul. And after Ananias' reply, look at verse 15 through 16. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he has to suffer for my sake. So God told Ananias his plan for Saul. But before that, what's the first word in verse 15? Go. And that's happened like twice in my life. I don't know if it was an audible voice, but it was something like that. The first time when I was wondering, man, who, should I marry Lisa? Should I marry Lisa? And you know what he said? He said, all he said was, are you going to grow up? 
That's what he said to me. And so when you're thinking about whether or not you should obey or not, think of God's backstory, right? Think of bad God's backstory. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. What is his name? He is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh. Do you know who I am? So when God tells you to go, go. And, uh, he, and then he shares with Ananias God's plan for Saul. This, he's he's going to be under new ownership. He has a new purpose. And he's going to experience a new pain. He says in verse uh, 16 and 15, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. And that's a paradigm shift. You are not your own. You belong to God. When you give your life to Christ, you give your life to Christ. Right? And then the new pur purpose, he's a chosen instrument, a vessel to carry my name. Um, not only Saul, but we have this it reminds me of that band, Chars of Clay, to me, is like the first good Christian band. Uh, we have this treasure in Jars of Clay, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Paul, a vessel to carry the name of Jesus, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And Saul is called to the Gentiles, to the kings, and to the children of Israel. And you read ahead in Acts and you'll see that is exactly what happens? He fulfills God's purpose. And, and where's the apostle? Listen, this is where Paul gets his authority from Jesus Christ the Lord. And he's going to experience this new kind of pain. Says, I will show him how much he must suffer. And if you fast forward, you know that list in 2 Corinthians 11. Labors, he's going to have imprisonments, beatings, near death. Receive 40 lashes minus one, beaten with rods, stoned, shipwrecked at sea, journeys, in danger of rivers, danger of robbers, in danger of my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, and from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, without food, cold and exposure. Yeah, sign me up. <laughs> No, thank you. And, and listen to this, verse 28. And apart from the other things, there is a, the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And isn't that true? If you have a ministry, and I think of all the kids I know, and I'm wondering, man, are you still tight with Jesus? Are you still walking with Jesus? Man, he ends that list with that. Um. God took Saul's passion and filled his heart with love for the churches. And he's going to experience this new kind of pain. And I tell you guys, it's part of the plan. When you take the class, let's say it's the way 101, suffering is on the syllabus. And I tell the little guys, little guys, put this in the back of your mind because it's fun, 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 fun. Play, 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 play. Uh, suffer now, glory later. And I tell that to, to us and remind myself of this. Suffer now, glory later. And that was Paul's plan. Uh, that was God's plan for Paul. New ownership, new purpose, and new pain. And Ananias probably thought to himself, Lord, you, you had me at go. You, <laughs> you had me at go. And so what does Ananias do? Look at verse 17 through 19. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, isn't that cool? Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me, um, has sent me to, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. What did Ananias do? He obeyed. Why is he laying his hands on, on Saul? Because that's what Jesus told him to do. He obeyed. I, I mean, it says uh, Ananias was sent and he went. And it's obedience. Now, I've met a lot of Pauls in my life. But I haven't met a lot of Ananiases. And it's probably because of that story, Ananias and Sapphira. But man, we need more Ananiases. You know, those little guys, those Samwise Gamshees, those Johns helping uh, 
King David? Or, or what about John's armor bearer? Do you remember that story? Or what about Andrew? Andrew's the one that invited Peter, and Andrew doesn't even get to be part of the three. So, man, be faithful in your ministry, whatever the Lord's called you to, and you never know. I love Ananias. Think about this. This is the most important event in, his, the, in history, one of the most important events in, in human history. And here's Ananias. I love that. Okay, so now what Jesus did. So if you obey and you re- leave the results up to God, here's what God did. Saul regained his sight, scales fell from his eyes, and he had a new vision. Saul was spiritually blind, and now he can really see. And if you're a believer, that's happened to you. Something like scales has fallen from your eyes. Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit, and Saul was baptized. And we all know it's a public confession of your faith. It says, I'm with him. I'm following Jesus. And you know it symbolizes being buried with Christ, being raised with him to a new life. Okay, and it's all pointing to what Jesus did. And what's the summary of that? It's conversion. Conversion. Conversion is the changing people from the inside out. It's the transformation. This is where Saul was converted. In our little uh, curriculum, it says the Christ connection was Paul was an enemy of Jesus. But then God changed him. When we trust Jesus, he changes us from the inside out. I mean, man, a little kid can get that. And from my, po- like, Pastor Chris White and, or Matt McAuliffe, when I was taking one of his classes, said, you've got to get one of these pocket dictionaries of theological terms. Isn't that great? Everybody ought, should ought to have one. But anyways, he said, this is what, if you look up conversion, this is what it says. It's a general term referring to an individual initial's encounter with God in Christ, resulting in the reception of God's gracious provision of salvation. Some of the changes brought about in conversion include a change of, in heart from being dead to sin to alive in Christ. That's genera- regeneration. It includes a change of status from being guilty before God to being not guilty. There's your justification. And a change in relationship from being an outcast, an enemy, to being a child and a friend of God. And that's your adoption and reconciliation. Conversion, you guys, begins, and this continues in that uh, pocket dictionary. Conversion begins the journey of discipleship through which a person who was once a slave to sin is being freed by the Holy Spirit for holiness and that sanctification. Now, I'm not waiting till the end, but man, do you believe this? I mean, we got to verse 31, all right? But right in the middle, I'm just asking, do you believe this? Have you been converted? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you trusted Jesus to be forgiven of your sins and right with God? It's not achieved, but it's received, as Tim Keller said. It's by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Have you done that? And after the men's lunch, uh, Rick Rogers, who's on the prayer team, said, you don't have a testimony without Jesus Christ. And I've heard it said, uh, submission to the Lord before mission for the Lord. And that's Paul. He had to submit to the Lord. He had to be converted first. It's probably from the same class. He's learning submission. The same class that taught humility and suffering. And you can get, if you get the order reversed, you're doing it in your own strength. Remember how the Ten Commandments started? It's not, you shall, number one commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't bow down to idols. But how does it start? Remember the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. It starts there to be changed. And so like me, before I was a Christian, I grew up in church. Before I was a Christian, I read the Bible, went to church, prayed, all that kind of stuff. But I wasn't a Christian. I it in my own strength until the grace of God got me on a mission trip. And I gave my life to him. I took him seriously. It's like, man... I don't want to play Christianity anymore. I want to trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So, 
And then what happens? So Saul's life before Christ, this is what happened. What Jesus got a hold of him, what Jesus Christ did in his life. And now, what's his life look like after Christ got a hold of him? And so look at, um, this is still, we're in Damascus. But Damascus, then Jerusalem. Chapter 9, verse 19 through 22. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem for those who called upon this name? And, and has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength. Verse 22, and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. So he stayed with the disciples in Damascus, there's probably other Christians like Ananias, and he immediately preached. Where did he preach? The synagogues. And what did he preach? Jesus is the Son of God. And I just pictured Jesus. And you can read his sermons and his letters, you know, just picture him. Fuck, I really saw Jesus. It's God in the flesh. Jesus really did rise from the grave. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And who heard him? Man, those other disciples, other people, Jews. And, and they were amazed because they were like, isn't this the guy who made havoc? And that's the same word as ravaging the church. Isn't this the same guy? But they couldn't deny it. Something had changed. There was real conversion happened. And he got Saul got stronger and proved that Jesus was the Christ. How? How did he prove that Jesus was the Christ? From scriptures. I mean, can you imagine that? He, he knew the scriptures inside and out. But now with this new vision, this new sight, he really knew the scriptures. And at the end of verse 22, Luke doesn't include this, but in Galatians 1, 16 through 17, Saul goes to Arabia and then returns to Damascus. And what are the preacher's results? Remember, obey and leave the results up to God. You preach Jesus, and then what happens? And you might be thinking, well, what if I don't like those results? Because what happens to Saul is uh, there's a rejection. Look at verse 23. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by the night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. The result is rejection. The Jews plotted to kill him, but it's not a failure. I like what this commentary said on, by Daryl Bach about Acts. The word is victorious even in rejection. The word goes out and people are hearing God's voice. It's like, I don't know who said it, either Calvin or, or Luther. You want to hear God's voice? Read the Bible. And so the word is going out and, and people are being changed and you don't know it. You might not see it. And for Paul, it was a humbling experience because he was lowered in the basket. Do you think Paul liked, do you think Saul liked being lowered in the basket? Because after that list he says, you know what, I want to boast, you want me to boast of my weakness? I had to be led, I had to be escape in a basket being uh, let down. I mean, Man, Saul, nothing stopping this guy. But it says the disciples took him. It's like, Saul, you got to get out of here. And so he had to be uh, humbly let down in a basket. And then the Saul, the preacher in Jerusalem, okay? But first, look at 26 through 27. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So that memory, that trauma, the PTSD was real. They still remember the persecution in Jerusalem. And how are they going to, I mean, that, that, that's where, um, but the convert it says, uh, I'm quoting John Stott, sorry. The convert joins the community and the community welcomes the convert. How did this happen? Because of Barnabas. God uses Barnabas. And 
Um, and you just think to yourself, man, who has your back? Who's your encourager? Um, in my life, one of my encouragers, he, he died actually this past year. And one of my best encouragers moved to, to Florida. But you need a Barnabas in your life. Keep praying. Don't give up. That's what the men are doing. Hopefully those strong friendships. Pray. Friendship is a blessing from the Lord. It can happen. Okay. And, and Saul can't stop preaching. So he's okay. Verse 28. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Verse 29. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. Those are the Greek-speaking Jews. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So he's preaching boldly that he's that zealous for, that he was zealous for persecuting the church. Now he's zealous for preaching Jesus Christ. And what's the re, more leaving the results up to God? What happens? <laughs> they try to kill him again. More rejection, more persecution. And the result of that is Saul had to be brought down. I mean, the, again, the disciples took him to Caesarea, a port city, so he could be sailed off to go to his hometown of Tarsus. And here's uh, the epilogue. And before that, just to review, Saul is called on the Damascus road. After three days in Damascus, he's converted and commissioned. And in Damascus and Jerusalem, he learns how costly preaching is. And then, verse 31, so the church, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It multiplied. And it's, that's awesome. The church is growing. God's doing his work, doing his thing. But isn't it interesting that when Saul leaves, the church has peace. Okay. And so maybe there's still some lessons to be learned for, for the man Paul. But I just find that interesting. So four, four things in application. Four close. To repent, rejoice, remind yourself. And when you share your testimony, give glory to God. To, for first thing, repent. If you're not a Christian, repent. If you are a Christian, repent. Um, Paul went from law to grace. That grace, it's something I don't deserve. You receive the grace. Receive the grace of God. Receive the grace of God and be free. Be free from pride. Be free from lies. Be free from the lies. Be free from addiction. Be free from bondage, man. Receive the grace of God and repent. It's like we teach the kids the ABCs. The ABCs of Christianity. Admit. A for admit. B for believe. I mean, you, what are you believing? That there is a God. I say God, sin, Christ, faith. There's the gospel. There is a God. You sinned. Man, Jesus is the only one who can save you. Put your faith in him. Okay, that's what you're believing when you trust Jesus. You're turning away from sin and you're turning to him. That's the repenting. And what's the C? Admit, believe, and the C is change. Sometimes it happens immediately. Like, like for Paul, Saul, he went out and immediately preached Jesus Christ. And sometimes it's a gradually change, gradual change. I want to be a better husband a better dad, a better children's pastor. Um, I just have to remind myself of the grace. I want that change. But to remind myself, man, Jesus does it. Jesus does it. And I go to him every time. And then rejoice. This is from the adult part of the uh, curriculum. It's by David McLemore. He says, if you rejoice, if you are in Christ you experience the same thing Paul did. It likely wasn't as dramatic, but it was no less miraculous. Something like scales has fallen from your eyes and you see with the newness of light now. Jesus is your greatest treasure and his gospel is your greatest hope. <laughs> Rejoice in that. And the quote continues. He led you by superintending your steps and bringing you to a point of conversion. His providence is always good beyond improvement. Thus, he crafted your story, included 
including your past, for his own optimum glory. And Jesus does that. Don't take that for granted. If it gets tough for you guys who have believed in Jesus Christ, know at least you have been saved. Another way to say it, our stories don't match Saul's for drama, but ours, but ours do match for significance. The most important event in anyone's life is coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What did Paul say in 1 Tim- Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 through 14? Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. It's the same grace. The grace he had for Saul is the same grace he has for us. It's the same mercy, the same grace. It might not be dramatic, but the miracle is legit. It's still a miracle. Rejoice. And I know, you guys, it's not always happy, clappy. um, But people are watching and people are being encouraged by what Jesus has done in your life. Um, It's like Pastor Travis always saying, um, you're going to that deep trust in God that Travis is always talking about. And you'll find, maybe not happy, clappy, but that Quiet, confident, tears of joy, rejoicing that, man, we've been saved. And that points to that intimacy with Jesus Christ. And and thirdly, remind yourself that if God can save you, if God can save you, he can save anyone. And think about, I didn't go into what's going on in the world and this and that. But if we start there, if God can save me, he can save anyone. It's a spiritual problem. And I had the spiritual problem. And same with the world. It's Jesus is the answer to Saul's problem and to our problem. It's a spiritual problem. And then lastly, we give these little cards away, these discussion cards um, to the parents The last thing I want to say is when you share your testimony and give glory to God, it says, parents, take time. And when we did this, I was supposed to speak last week, so Saul, uh, Acts chapter 9 was last week. But listen, parents, take time to share your testimony with the family this week. Think about how you can describe how your life changed when you met Jesus. And if kids have professed faith in Christ, allow them to share their testimony with the family as well. So I just want to close with this. When you share your testimony, give glory to God. There's your life before Christ, what Jesus did in your life, and your life after. Spend, make sure you give glory to God. Don't talk. You don't want to talk. You want to talk more about God than you do about yourself. Does that make sense? You give glory to him. and And hopefully you get to the gospel. Because it's the gospel, not your testimony, the power of salvation. It's the gospel is the power of God to salvation. And close with this, Galatians 1, 23, 24. After Paul is done sharing his uh, conversion story, it says, when they heard it, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorify God. They glorify God because of me. Let's pray. I'm going to ask the um, worship team to come up. Heavenly Father, You are a great and amazing God. You are in the business of changing lives. And I pray that never gets old for us, Lord. That we would just be in awe. We would be amazed. That we would rejoice. And that we would uh, just, just be in gratitude and thankful for how you changed us, Lord. And I pray that you would keep doing that, even in this room, Lord. If there's someone who hasn't experienced that conversion, that touch from you, Lord, change their lives. And Father, um, I thank you again for this opportunity to teach, Lord. I pray that you would be blessed. And as we uh, go, um, that you would send us out. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen.